Um, so yeah, we we basically going to cover three main topics. The first one will be the, the like the inception of a design team and all the team is growing uh, with the with time. The second part will be about the roles and mission of a product designer, and the third one will be more into process tools and KPIs. The idea is like we have a bunch of questions we I want to ask uh, for them, but if you have any question, if you you want them to go like deeper into the, the answers. Don't hesitate to uh, like interrupt us, raise your hand, and you can ask wh whatever question you have in mind. Okay? So don't feel free. We are in friends, in a group of friends. So yeah, let's ask. Uh, first, maybe the first question: uh, What is a product designer? Uh, we heard like UX, UI designer, designer, product designer, and many other like words to describe your job. So can you tell us more about your definition or your vision of what is exactly a product designer? Okay, I start. Uh, so I think design is, uh, especially product design, is so new that we went through different titles uh, over the years, actually. And I personally, I studied communication design, and what we were doing back then was the websites. So there was no mobile phones, no mobile apps. We were just doing websites, and these were usually short-lived websites. It was for campaigns, actually. And uh, there, then the products came: Facebook, uh, Twitter. They all kind of taught us how a digital product should be. It's not just a short-lived uh, campaign website, but it's actually something that is uh, uh, that people go every day, they use every day, uh, and then it, it evolves with time and with usage. And I, I guess like around that time we started calling, we started needing to call different names. So user interface designer was a common name, UX designer was another one, interaction designer was another one. I think in France, the economics is, it became very pop popular at some point. Uh, and then I remember we started calling ourselves also service designers because we were thinking that, okay, product is not enough. Uh, then we need, to build, we need to have services around the products. Uh, it seems that we settled now on digital product design uh, or product designers. Uh, I don't know if it's the correct one, but it's the current one actually. And I think so far it is the best describing one because at the end we are, we are working on the product. So whether product design or service design, I think they are kind of like right now the best, best titles that can describe what we do. So it's not just about the details of the user interface we are working on. It's not about the user experience we are working on. It's not about the interaction design motion we are working on. But it's the whole product. It's the whole thing that we are responsible for. Yeah. So, so, so the way I think about product design is like there's two 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 part of the of, there's two sides. So there's like the discipline of product design and then the job of a product designer. And I think uh, the discipline of product design is not only the fruit of the job of the product designer, simply because in a company there is like a lot of other teams who are responsible for what the ultimate user experience is going to be. Uh, marketing, uh, customer support. So I think when I think about product design, I think like from, a user, from the, the user point of view, um, when a user use, uses a product, it's a, it's a bunch of touch points that the user has with the product from the website, from the onboarding from the first use agent. And the entire experience is like one on one single thing that he is going to leave. So basically, when I try to think about product design, I try to think about it from like a real big holistic picture. Um, and then you have like the job of the product designer. And I think that the job of the product designer is to be the guardian of this experience. So the, the, daily you, the daily work of a product designer is going to, to work on the functional part of the product. And then, so there is like an emotional side and a, and a functional side for every product. And uh, the emotional side is going to work to be the work of the product designer, the marketing. And the product designer, the designer is especially going to focus on the functional side. Um, then I think, yeah, sorry, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if I can add anything, but uh, I am having trouble with titles. I always ask. That's why I'm only a designer on that side, um, because I don't actually like the label product designer. Because outside, uh, I'm actually responsible for the whole experience, and it goes through marketing as well, and user, and uh, it's not only the product. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I would add. Okay, cool. And 
What's about like hiring? Uh, how to start a product team, and uh, especially a product design team? When to? What is the right time to hire like the first designer or product designer in, in a team? And what, in your opinion, or in at your company, or, or, or it happened? Uh, we were really lucky at SIGHT because uh, it was something that was really important for the founders from the get-go. And so I actually joined the team. I'm one of the first employees. And uh, actually, um, which is rare in France, is that there was a designer because before there was a, an actual project manager. Um, and um, so I would say as soon as possible. I mean, as soon as you start interacting with users and you have people that need to use your interfaces, uh, you're going to need a designer. And uh, they have a way of thinking that's completely different from you because they're, they're used to using products, uh, looking at products, and looking at it in the way of uh, the user's point of view rather than business. I, I agree, as soon as possible. Can you, can you tell us more about what happened at the first when I have no idea, actually. I mean, uh, when I joined, there were. To be honest, I think it's surprising because when I joined, there were two designers. And this is a company that has existed uh, for nine years when I joined. Uh, it's surprising. And that, I mean, you see the effect of it in the product. Of no way two designers can keep up with the requirements of, of a product like that. Uh, so hiring at the right time is important. And I think it's as soon as possible. But scaling with the product is also as important, actually. You want to add something? Yes, yeah, so I, I definitely agree that hiring, uh, those having product design very early on is uh, like super important. And I think there's the, uh, more and more product that we see, which are like the, the first version of the product is shipped with a really great design. And I think it's really, uh, it's funny because like a few years ago, we were uh, talking a lot about lean startup and MV, MVPs, and you have to ship a product that is very basic. You don't have to worry too much about anything other like the basic core features. And I think we see more and more products that are shipped with like great engineering and great design, but are just focused on a very core specific set of features. Um, and then they iterate on that. But I think we see more and more design being a real par core part of the core pro uh, product development and not some kind of a cherry pick you put at the end, at, at the end of the process. Um, so yeah, I think design is more and more uh, a real competitive advantage for a lot of products. And uh, yeah. I think one great example is Airbnb. Airbnb, one of the co-founders of Airbnb is a designer, actually. Why not? Yeah, that, that's a great example. And uh, what about the agency? Do you think like external, like, like subcontractor can do the job? Like, can you have like a external product designer or designer? And did it happen at your company or not at all? You you start with a uh, like almost with the first product. I'm sure you have already like designer and Benjamin, I think you, you studied from scratch uh, at Dream. So what is your point of view, even if you didn't really face this challenge at your companies? What, what do you think? We did actually, um, because the app was first designed by a, a freelance and it was not the best idea. Um, the thing is, if you, I mean, plus we were babies. I mean, in the terms that we were really all very young and inexperienced when we started side. Um, so, the thing is, we didn't know anything about like defining the problems that you want to solve while building your app. And so the freelancers was, were like, it was hard to manage a freelancer without him having the clearest constraints. And so I think freelancer would be, now a freelancer would be fine as soon as we're able to define the problem that we want the freelancer to solve. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty, it's really complicated because you can't really brief him properly. So I would say at first, um, Unless you're really, you're really, I mean, experience, uh, yeah, what you want, I would want. Uh, again, I, I completely agree. The, the thing is with the agency, they will never be able to spend the time they need to understand your product in detail. And I think product design doesn't happen in isolation. It has to be happening with, with the product teams, with the engineering teams at the same time. And, and it has to, it has to go through iterations. You cannot just decide what to do immediately in the first go. You cannot achieve the greatest results. And I've seen actually companies working with uh, agencies, 
Uh, the work is great. It might be, I mean, it's not agency's fault either, but what happens uh, is that the work is maybe not the right work for this type of company. Uh, and then you have something great, but it's not compatible. So basically in, in our case, we work with a lot of external designers over the years, um, and especially on the, on the hardware part, because like hardware and especially like a wearable is real, it's a real special thing to build. Uh, you need a lot of different specialties, and uh, we could just have them inside the company. But uh, when you when you work on a hardware product, it's like cycles, and uh, spe specification cycles are like building a new hardware product is very long. So you're going to have uh, some time when the designers are going to have a lot of work, and then it's going to be a downtime. So it didn't make any sense to have like to have um, a whole team of uh, hardware designer working in the in the team. So we work with Fuse Project. I don't know if you know the Fuse Project, but it's like a, a big, uh, a big uh, design agency in San Francisco. Um, so that's for the hardware part. For the um, for the software part, uh, we do believe a lot with, uh, in having internal designers too. Um, so in the first version of the app, we work with external designers. But the thing is, like, I think it's it's the same for all product. But in our case, like, sleep is a real complex problem, and we have. A lot, of, uh, a lot of things to learn from our users. We have to define the, the problems, the right problems, to find a good solution. And um, and when we when you work with an external agency, you have to to specify early on a set of problems you are going to solve. The thing is, the problems are evolving as you go on. So the cycles, like the feedback cycles, are too long. If you work with an external line designers, if you have designers inside, it's just much faster. So you can iterate iterate much faster. And, uh, and I think get a better product at the end. So, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Not at this time, but um, so we have a lot of expertise in house, uh, and especially in hardware, in building hardware. Um, so, the, the core design part of the hardware is still with Fuse Projects, um, but I can't, um, can't tell anyone. <laughs> so, one question. Yeah. So just to let you know, we're working on Mushu Mushu. And uh, now just to, I, I can't agree more with you. I'm really convinced that product design is really something that people should manage internally and that you can't, I'm really, I'm really convinced that you can't hire any agency to do the product design side because that's something that you do on the daily basics. And that's not something that you can come up with like crazy ideas and stuff because this is the product that you're building. And I really want to say to people, if you want to hire someone or an agency to help you on the product side, that's a bad idea. That's it. Thanks. Uh, yes, no? I would actually nuance that because it depends. It could be really interesting if you, have, if you don't have it in the house and you want to... Um, so in design, I feel like there is a lot of uh, uh, short term and long term. So where do you want to go and where are you going right now and which are the next steps? And sometimes it's interesting to actually call an agency and just have them think about your problem in a completely different way. So you can, so that would be actually interesting. And then it also depends if you're a product first company. Yeah, Benjamin. I would add also that there's like a lot of great products that have been designed from agencies. Uh, I think one example is Slack, which was uh, for the most part designed by MetaLab, I think. No? Oh, okay. okay, all right. I just like to meet that meta itself. Okay. Okay, no, yeah. I know, like, the, the, okay. So, what I think you're saying is, like, the, the, the only, the only Slack uh, product was built from the, um, from an internal tool, which they had at, um, at the product, they, they did, the, the company they had before. And, uh, but I think MetaLab worked a lot on this, and also on doing interaction, you're saying now? Okay. Okay. So all right. That's that's a bad example. But I think there's some some good product that been. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, no, there's still good products. It it really depends on the agency the designers are working with. Sometimes you're going to have someone intern in 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 the company which is not going to be so good, and you can have find like real really good agency. So it's, I think, you you you, you never have to generalize. But, uh, but for the most part, it's better to have designers inside. 
Okay, thanks a lot for, for your answers. And again, if you want to ask any question, don't hesitate, raise your hand and it would be your turn. Uh, so you like all agree that hiring a product designer uh, at the first time from zero, it's the best, uh, the best thing to do, or one of the best things to do. Um, what about the background, the experience, the skills you are looking for for the first product designer, so the first one to join the company? Is, is it something, someone special? <laughs> so uh, this is a very actually difficult question because maybe you're going to be hiring a designer without knowing uh, what you should ask. And uh, the, what I always look personally uh, from all the hires uh, I've done uh, is, is, the be, is the behavior, is the attitude, is the approach. Not the experience, not the skills. But I think if you're hiring for the first time for your startup, I think you have to look at a bit uh, experience profile so that they will guide you during the process. But then anything after, I think you should be focusing on the behavior and attitude. How do they approach the projects? Do they have an open mind? Uh, can they uh, criticize their own work? Can they work with, uh, collaborate with different teams? Those are, I think, more important than any, any other skill that you can get. Yeah, I, I think when you, when you need to design a product like from very early on, like just building a new product, you have to, uh, you have to need someone, you need someone who is like really good at um, a lot of different things because he's going to define your product. So if you're not the one, uh, if you're not the one who is going to build and design the product and you need someone external, he's going to define a, a big part of your product. So first you have, you need, you need to find someone who you're, you're comfortable working with and uh, with which you have a good communication and the second part someone you can trust a lot um, so the way I see it like is like for bigger companies I think uh, you have uh, you might better have designer who have like who are really great at, at one thing uh, early on I think it's better to have someone who is going to be able to have the, the, the huge the, the big picture of the product so the psychology part, the user psychology part, the UX, UI, who is going to be able to define how the design is going to be aligned with the, tra the strategy of the company. So, I don't know. Uh, personally, I think he's going to be um, in a, product, a product designer and a product manager at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Like you said, uh, the culture mindset is really important to make sure that you're going to be able to work with them easily. Um, then, in terms of just playing his skills, um, there's a really good skill called ethic. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, lucky enough, we, uh, we actually so we get trained. Um, we know technical stuff. Uh, we actually learn to code. And so if you're looking for a designer, make sure you actually has seen some code and knows how it's working. So that's pretty basics, but you might not know about this. Um, and um, understand what design is. So there's one thing I actually made kind of like a big assumption. I don't think that was correct when hiring designers or actually kind of working with the design team. Uh, when uh, because I like uh, ambigu uh, ambiguity. I like open-ended questions. I like to work with things that are not so certain, that are not limited, that we can explore and then go further. And I was thinking that, okay, every, maybe every designer should be like this. But what I've seen over the years is there are some designers who are comfortable with that are things uh, that are not uh, clear, uh, so that they can define it themselves. But there are also designers who really want the limitation, who they want the frame clearly defined so they can explore within the frame themselves. And, and this is really interesting because they can do both. It's not, uh, one is not better than the other either, but you need different people in different time frames. So you need to look which one do you need actually. You need someone who's really going into details, iterating, and then making the product better and better every day. Or do you need someone who defines your vision, uh, but who cannot focus on the details. So these are actually two different profiles you really need to think about. What, which one do you need? And maybe the first hire is a combination of both, but the uh, hires after that, you really need to complement the skills uh, that you have and your designer have uh, and other people in the company have. Um, I will add one, one point, which is, I think, a bit similar, is that um, I think you have 
uh, some designers who are very comfortable working in like one type of product or one type of they have some kind of style uh, in the work, and then you have other designers which are comfortable working in like not having uh, a very core style but just working and following like some kind of running di uh, guidelines, design systems. Um, and I think early on you have to find someone who is going to be able to uh, change with you because when you don't know what the product is, when you don't know what your design is going to be like, if you have someone who has like a, a, a style, I, I don't know if it's the, the, the right word, but which is too strong, um, it's not going to be easy to find to define the, um, what the product is to have like a, a voice uh, uh, emerge. So um, so yeah. Yeah, one last thing I would add is that your first designer has to kind of be as much uh, uh, in love with the problem you're solving as you are. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any question on this topic in the audience? No? Um, yeah, catch it. <laughs> As a young designer, do you believe in something like uh, best practices, or or do you have to be free and no limitation? The question was, as a designer, do you believe in best practices, or do you believe in free So, who wants to answer this question? With... <laughs> okay, no answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I really understand the question, though, but I think it really depends on the situation and depends on what you want to do. Uh, and there, there will be cases that you need to follow the best practices, and if you're really <laughs> focusing on the technical, for example, web or native design, yes, it, you have to follow the best practices or research. Uh, but there are going to be the times that you're going to be defining the vision, and I think design has to be involved defining the vision of company. So there, there, you, there you need to be quite free, actually. I think I will answer both. Uh, you need best practices. You, 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 as a young designer, I think you need to build a, a foundation uh, built on best practices. But the, then the foundation is going to help you explore. And um, and so if you're just exploring without like having a strong foundation of what is going to be uh, what is going to be uh, buildable, like if you just design things but that can't be built, um, you're probably not going to be a successful product designers. So, of course, you have to uh, read best practices and understand them, but you don't have to follow them because, as a designer, you also, you also have to find your own voice. So, yeah, I think my answer is just you need to do both. I was, yeah, so that's what you were kind of hinting at before, was the, the thing about the designer should be able to have a long-term vision and be able to step back and say, okay, where are we going? And then at the same time, you should be able to solve the real day-to-day uh, -day problems and so and follow sometimes the best practices. Um, but I would always say you need to, it's like Picasso learning to learning about heart before we did cubism. So you need to know the best practices because before you can actually go below them. Uh, no. Uh. Uh, it is. Um, in addition to this question, uh, just maybe you, the guest, and maybe the audience, by raising your hands, do you think a designer need to know how to code or not? <laughs> no? Yes? Who is, who is for? Who know? Okay, I'm going to change the question. Okay. okay, who knows how to code? Okay, let's see. Alf. Okay, so this was my only bad question of tonight, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so this is my question. Should a designer know about business? We're going to talk <laughs> about this in the, next, in the next section about the role uh, and the mission of the designer and uh, oh, he's going to sit here. Yeah, we have the team. We're going to answer it later. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, and then uh, actually, uh, uh, should the designer learn to write? I mean, so that's the main thing for me. Okay. Um, so, okay, it's not like um, easy to find the first product designer because there is like many things to consider. Uh, what about the hiring process? I mean, uh, from a business point of view, uh, if I have like no 
idea of what exactly I'm looking for in terms of product and design, product design. Uh, where uh, should I start to look for like a product designer? Um, or can I hire and make sure that I'm hiring the right product designer or the right designer? Meaning like, oh, can I test during the, the, the different interviews and during the onboarding that I'm, yeah, I'm not doing the, the wrong choice? What's your point of view on this question about the hiring when you don't have the, the like design skill while hiring? Um, so, so I don't have much experience hiring designers. I just hired one, uh, but it was like a few months ago. And the way uh, we approached it was like, uh, so we knew we had to, we needed someone who was really great at executing like uh, product design. And we knew we also had, uh, we needed someone who, who had great problem solving skills. So we approached it uh, in two steps. The first one was like, can you execute and simply portfolio. So we, we didn't like spend a lot of time uh, checking like background experience, etc. We were really focused on the portfolio. Um, and the reason is just, if you need how to build product, you might be able to show it. Um, so I really like a uh, designer who uh, have been able to work like on a, on a full product or have uh, either as a side project or as a full-time job. Um, so we are looking for that. And also, um, so the first step was like, okay, do you, can you build products? Can, can, you, can you design products? The second step was, can you solve problems? And the way we did that was simply by a test. And it was not an easy test. So basically, when, we, when you sleep with the dream headband, we, we, uh, we get a lot of data from your night, which is um, put in a report, which is going from the headband to the app. And the app just has, like, in the minutes after your, your night is uh, finished, has a lot of data. And the, the, the problem we, the, the designer had to solve was, OK, how can you tell a story about someone's night through all this data? And uh, this, it was a re really difficult test because you have to choose. Like, you cannot show the user every, everything. There is a lot of things which are going to be irrelevant, too complex. So you had to pick the right, um, so the, the, the right information, put it in the right context and uh, in the right order to make it like a, an easy, um, insightful um, night explanation. Uh, so yeah. We, we, that, that's the way we approached uh, the, the hiring by doing this test, and we hired someone who is really good, so we're happy. Um, so, if you are not a designer, I would say uh, define a problem, and then uh, when you get a result, ask question, a lot of question, and just to understand if the designer actually um, understands the, I mean, has made conscious choices. Uh, while designing and so uh, have conversation first and then yeah make sure that um, the way he thinks about what is solving makes sense and is um, yeah uh, uh, I agree completely the, I will add one thing actually what you said uh, doing things is great explaining them is more important so what I, when I actually uh, do an interview what I ask can you just explain a piece from your portfolio? It doesn't matter if you have 10 work or anything. If you can explain just one in a very clear way why you have done certain things, why you have done, gone through certain choices, and why you have ended up here, this is the most important thing. Uh, and then if they, if they can do it, and this actually goes back to the writing as well. I mean, if, they, if, if, the, if the portfolio is online, if the writing is clear, it can explain the whole story, then it, it's perfect. <laughs> It, it makes perfect sense. And talking about hiring, uh, we are now going to talk about the growth of the, the product design team or the designer team. Uh, maybe you, you will explain what, uh, what happened at your, your company and especially you at at Dailymotion. It's quite um, interesting to, to deep dive. Um, so when it's the right time to hire like a new designer, when do you realize that having just one, let's say, designer in the team, it's not enough. There is like too much things to do. Uh, how do you rely that, and uh, what is the process to like make the, the, the team growth in the best way, for sure? So I'm going to ask, answer this one from a completely different perspective, because we scaled the design team to 19 people at one point, and we had an approach to pair designers. So no designer was working alone in any project, actually. So maybe I can think of this question in a sense that 
when a project needs a designer and when you need the two designers, not one. And I will say it's always like, uh, if you must, yes, you can have one person design team, but it's, it's, it's impossible to move forward in a, in a kind of like a good way with one designer. The designers need to bounce ideas between each other. I think that's why every project needs two designers. And I'm thinking, I'm saying project because maybe at some points like we have four or five projects going at the same time in daily motion. Uh, but uh, you can think of just a, a, a project as a startup in a, in a, in a small company. So I, I think that you, so basically the, the way we work at Dreams, so in the product team um, for the last year and a half, uh, I was alone as a product manager and also doing product design. And uh, it was a lot of, lot of work. And the thing is when you're, when I was like doing both work, uh, there was like a part of the product manager job, which I was not doing really good. And a part of the product designer job, which I was not doing really good. And so basically for us, the decision was really easy. So we really needed someone in house. But the thing is, uh, if you bring too many designers in house too early, I think, because you're trying to define your product, it's going to be, uh, and if the product is not defined yet, if you don't have a design system, I think we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, you're just, uh, the risk is that it's going to be going in the multiple uh, different ways. So um, it's, it's good to have like a core and uh, small design team at the beginning when you're defining your product. And I think when you have the product defined, then you can grow the design team, bring people on. And uh, because like there is going to be a lot of work, a lot of iteration you're going to. And so having people who are, that are specialized and much better than you at, your, at that is going to be really helpful. Uh, I would also add that if you have a lot of developers, uh, at one point your designer is going to be, I mean, they're going to need work. And so you're going to need to produce a lot of stuff and solve a lot of problems. And sometimes if you want to solve them well, uh, you need more designers. So that would be the first way. I mean, that's the way we hired our second designer, I'd say. Do you, yeah, I'm going to ask you, uh, what is the ratio between like developers or product manager and designer? Do you have like a special metrics to follow and say, okay, now we have too much developers and we need an extra designer? Do you follow metrics like this or not at all? No. Uh, what I can say is actually, uh, I don't think it exists. I mean, it really depends on the company and the speed. Uh, but what we have, what happened to us is, uh, so when I joined, we scared the team quite a lot. Uh, we wanted to renew the whole daily motion, so we went, we went into kind of different stages, uh, design sprints, defining the product, and uh, because we had people, I think we've done like five design sprints on a row, which lasted like two months, which was crazy. Uh, but we've, we've arrived somewhere, then we started going into details and then changing the whole product. What happened was actually the dev team was actually focused on other things. And in a bad way, but we had to do this way, we handed off the designs and they started developing. And because we scaled the team to do the whole design thing, and uh, at some point, uh, like I said, we reached 19 people. What happened was uh, designers were waiting, they were to finish. Because we, wanted to, we didn't want to continue this way. We wanted to be truly working together, collaborating. So we had to wait for designer developers to catch up, release the product, then we can go into iteration cycles. And this actually cost us a lot. Uh, we lost, uh, I think, like uh, within a couple of months, we lost four or five designers immediately because they didn't have too much to do. Um, no, okay. <laughs> do, we, do we have any question in the audience? No, everything's clear. Yeah, okay. Hi, who's in charge of the uh, the building of the design system in your team? And how do you work with this person? It was a question for later, but we can't do it right now. Do you have any input on the design system topic? So we don't really have a design system yet at Um Because, um, I mean, we're clearly thinking about it. We're more or less having a UI kit. Um, but the thing is, at site, uh, so your, your design system, it needs a sun to revolve around in some ways. Uh, and for example, the platform that we have for companies, it's been, um, we change a lot, uh, we pivoted. And the way we think about our product and where it's going, uh, the platform that we have currently, it's not working at all. 
And so there is no, um, no reason to build a design system around something that we're going to trash or destroy. Um, but then, uh, at the same time, every time you design things, uh, you need to um, uh, think about how it's going to work in terms of vision and etc. Um, the thing is, that platform was built before I arrived also. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't really thought in a system way. So that's funny because like the, the design system is typically the thing uh, I was telling that uh, as a uh, as a PM and a product designer there was a lot of things that I really wanted to do uh, from the, from a design point of view but I had, had like, no time working on and the design system one was one of them and uh, and the other thing that's funny is like design system is supposed to help you get more done it's going to be a lot of work at the beginning because it's like it's upfront work but then when you have it and you're building other features and other things is going to make your work much easier. Um, so that's like the paradox, the paradox of the design system. And uh, and yeah, so we just went through a big rebranding. So we're currently working on our design system. And uh, and I really think that it's a, a, a super, super important part of, uh, so it's like both the design system and like the UI kit you were uh, talking about, but uh, having a product that is very consistent is super important because it helps your users uh, it reduces like the, the mental effort your user has to, uh, to need to have to use your product simply because uh, he's going to learn your code uh, one time and then every time he's going to use your product and uh, through every other feature he's going to be able to just apply them and uh, he's going to just it's just going to make his life easy I have like one example which is uh, unpopular but uh, so I think a lot of product designers really hate the hamburger menu uh, but it's funny because like uh, through all the products of Google, they use this menu, and even if from a from a, a usability point of view, it's like the, not the best choice. The thing, like the only fact that it's really consistent across all the products, make it really easy for a Google user to just find his way through the product. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's a really important thing, uh, but it's something we tend to put uh, after like more uh, a priority work, uh, simply because it's upfront work. But uh, in the long run, it helps you uh, build product faster, and it helps your users. So, yeah. uh, related to, uh, I mean, your question, uh, I think we always underestimate the amount required for design system for to, to build it first and to maintain it. And uh, just to give an example, Airbnb, they have uh, 10, 15 people, uh, the just design system team. Uh, they're all, uh, some of them are designers, and some of them are developers. And we always tend to forget this part as well. I think design system is only possible uh, if the devs are have buy-in on it as well. And uh, what uh, what they say is in the in the Airbnb in design system team, they have uh, the best developers of the company. It makes sense because then other developers are going to grab that code and use it. And if you have the best developers, of course, the more junior ones will 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 be happy to grab that code. Yeah, it's okay. Another question on the back. Yeah. Okay, you mean what is the position like of the product design? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, we want to answer this question first. No? Um, so, uh, at side, um, we first started with a designer, me, um, and the goal was to solve problem. I mean, to design to mo design mockups and to make it faster for developers to implement them and then ship product and move on and grow. And then we started, uh, we had a product manager and uh, it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> product managers are like the best friends of a designer because they're, um, like what you were saying about when you have a product manager and a product designer, you kind of become uh, schizophrenic in some ways. Because you're like, okay, there is this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. Oh my God, which one am I gonna tackle first? And yeah, all those two, yeah, it's gets really complicated. Uh, and so the product manager uh, luckily gives you like a frame 
uh, in which to work. That's how we do it at site. So uh, at site, uh, the PM is uh, responsible for like defining the problem and saying, okay, we, we're going to tackle this problem first. And then the designer comes in and say, okay, there is this solution, this solution, this solution. Then we scope it uh, with the uh, developers and the product manager. Like, okay, this solution is actually taking a really long time for what it's going to bring to our users. And then we implement. That's usually the way we work together as a product team. Um, and then we also work with like uh, marketing. And that's still, uh, because the marketing team is slowly growing outside, it's not really, we don't have like a, a precise process. But usually, every time we work, what we want to try to do is uh, define the problem we're trying to solve. And that's true for everything, even in marketing. Uh, I agree. I think the last part is very important, especially uh, because sometimes we always focus on the solution, but I think design has to play a role defining the problem as well. And uh, this happens with all different uh, parts of the company. And uh, for example, I mean, in daily motion, we're not great with, for example, customer support. Uh, just the requests are quite, quite actually uh, harsh. Uh, but what we try to do is actually we try to work with the content providers to, to define the products that are suitable for them to publish. Uh, or, or we try to look at the data uh, and then work with the data team as close as possible so we understand what is working, what is not working. Uh, and then so that we can define the problems that we are going to focus on and not only the solutions actually. I think this is really important for design to have an important uh, position in organizations. And uh, that we need, that, that's a step we need to do uh, uh, everywhere, I think. In, in, in every organization. That, that's funny because you two raised two, uh, like the, my, my main point, which, which is like, uh, if you're both doing product design and product management, you have like a huge bias, which is that you're going to prioritize your solutions over your problems. Um, because the thing is like, uh, so it's important to have like a, a hierarchy. So problems come first, solution comes afterwards. You have to solve the right problem. And when you're both producing, and then trying to understand what's happening, you tend to uh, just, because you have like, you're able to produce solutions, you're just going to have like some favorite solutions, some favorite feature you want to ship. Um, and then you're just going to be too much focused on that. And there are other problems which are like more central, but maybe not as sexy as the, 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 the super feature you want to ship. And, uh, and you're just going to be biased toward uh, shipping like the sexy stuff you just designed and not uh, sort of the fundamental product. So like from someone who had done like, had both roles, uh, there was definitely a schizophrenia uh, because it was really hard, like always asking yourself, like what is the main problem we're trying to solve? And uh, so we worked a lot on that and you just have sometimes to switch uh, to be in like problem, like trying to define the problem and don't, don't try to think too much about potential solutions and then you come to the solution part and you can just let creativity and like on the product design or the product design stuff happen but uh but there is like a, a hierarchy like the, the problems come first and the solution yeah but that, that, i tried to switch my i tried to switch mindset now it's much easier because i had i have someone in the team so uh, the idea was like i'm going just going to um, uh, delegate like most of the of the solution finding and of course going to be involved but uh, just try to focus much more on the problem, and uh, and then we're going to build a solution together. And of course, it's going to take it's always going to take time and like uh, a common effort. But I think uh, if you're doing both, it's really hard. And having at least one people who is going to help you a lot with the solution part helps you focus on the problem. Uh, just helps you get the, the the nose into the data and the talk to users and all this stuff. You you have less time to do if you're just doing both uh, both work. Thanks for, for all your answers. Do, do you have another question, maybe? No more question yet. Okay, so just to, to continue on, on this point, what is exactly the, the structure of the, the like product team uh, at your company? Uh, we talk a lot about product squad during the first product stories meetup. Uh, is it something you, you implemented at your companies or are you doing something totally different? Can you tell us more about how you work with all the product team? Um, so, we definitely, I mean, we love the idea of squad, we love the idea of um, 
uh, having the developers being able to help with the solution because that's, I mean, usually they have better uh, ideas than most people. Um, but uh, yeah, and so right now at uh, side we have so we have two product managers, two designers, and uh, we have eleven developers. And so uh, we have this part where we define problems, find solution, and implement them. Uh, and right now we're actually, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, so the product managers in charge of prioritizing and defining the, the problem, and then of course you're like bouncing ideas with each other to um, to find solutions. Developers are developers, and designers designers. Uh, but then um, we. Right now, what we're currently seeing at side is that uh, when you have a lot of um, uh, that, actually, you start. Um, so I was saying, like long term, short term, um, the kind of the shipping and everything is like more short term, and so sometimes uh, you realize that you don't have the developers, and so you get to actually find your own problems and start exploring and actually think about that long-term vision to actually influence your product managers to uh, understand and see how you can uh, change the product and make it evolve. And so that's one part of the designing process as well. Do you design something and park it and then do it later? Uh, in isolation. So you, do, you, you think about the vision, you design something, uh, but you, you put it aside because there's no developers who are, who can develop, and then you you come back to it later. Uh, yeah, that happens. But then, uh, um, so in, that allows us to uh, convince people in some ways of okay, and make them uh, motivated and aware of the vision, and like we can show them okay, this is how it could be, and uh, and then we can simply uh, yeah, we go back to it later and uh, actually uh, think about it more in terms of like uh, the, con the technical constraints and everything. Uh, I can go. Uh, so, so, right now, what we do is actually—I mean, it's a bit luxury, maybe, but we have uh, around five product managers uh, distributed different products. But we have two designers per product manager, so they can bounce ideas between themselves. And then we have front developers per platform. So, front, uh, uh, front web, uh, Android, iOS, sometimes Apple TV, sometimes Android TV. And this is actually creates a massive team. Uh, so. It also comes with its own uh, kind of like downsides, but which, which all, this also enables us to tackle pro problems very quickly. We can actually start uh, working on something and release uh, in a very quick, short amount of time. So, a trend, so the, the product team is focused is uh, composed by um, right now four product managers. Uh, so, one about a year and a half ago, we were only two. When I joined the product team, uh, there was like one product manager handling the entire product, which is like, it's kind of a complex product. You have like a headband measuring your brain activity, and you have an app, you have the coaching part. Uh, and so we had to scale the product team. So uh, there are two new product managers who joined. Um, then we had like, one designer join. And uh, and the thing is like, we, we are trying to organize ourselves like by squad, trying to solve like one big problem at a time. Uh, so we were just trying a lot of things uh, within the process because the thing is, like, we have a very complex product. We have uh, a product, like, we cannot ship uh, a feature which has not been super uh, tested, uh, which has been uh, defined, like, in, in the real right way. So, basically, uh, we don't have, like, uh, a lean startup mentality. We don't ship, like, MVPs. We really try to ship the right, um, so, the, yeah, the, the, a product which, a feature which is built the right way. and. Uh, and we, we realized that we really needed to scale the product team because uh, so I, uh, a colleague told me that like, you need uh, one product manager per five developers. I don't know if that's true. But um, but as the product grows in complexity, you have to scale the product team. Thanks. Any question? Yeah, so uh, no, but OK. Um, yeah. Uh, 
uh, yes, to me, that's two different things because the designer is actually uh, should be actually the one in um, that's uh, the user advocate, whereas the PM is more of a business advocate. Um, and uh, what we do actually outside and what we're working on as we because currently we're growing the team and in like a year we've been uh, I mean we doubled the team I think we're now 60 people um, and so one of the problems that we have is that um, there's less and less people actually um, talking directly to customers and so one of our new challenges is uh, how can we make it uh, possible and to make everybody obsessed about the experience and um, and think about the user first and uh, like be really careful about uh, knowing that the decision that you're taking every day because everybody is actually designing in your company everybody is making decisions all the time and like uh, building the company with you you're not the only one making decisions and so the one of the role of the designers I think is to make sure that everybody understands uh, who the user is what is doing what is actually experiencing um, plus that side a lot of the experience is actually happening offline, completely offline. I mean, we, we have no control over it. And so I said it's like 10% of what's actually, I mean, the, the app is actually in 10% of what's actually happening. And so um, right now, we're um, at site, we have like designers have a, have a, a OKR of like um, interviewing uh, one, I mean, one user uh, every week can be a site or a company. I think they need to be exposed 100%. And what I want to try is that there are some companies doing this. Uh, whenever there's a new joiner, they put the designer into the support team for a couple of weeks so they see exactly where the problems are. So um, at, at Dream, we believe a lot of in, in testing because we have uh, in user testing and uh, user research and, um, and prototypes. So basically, we have like a very diverse, uh, we have very diverse customers. We have like young people who are really into technology and just want to measure their sleep. And we also have like 75, 80 years old users who have like real troubles falling asleep. So we are building a product for like a broad range of users and, uh, and we need to be good for all these users. So it's really important that like usability is a big issue. Um, and so what we've been doing is like, um, I told you we shipped a new app, uh, which is called the dream coach, which has, uh, therapies and, and programs built into it to help you and, and guide you. And, uh, and the idea, like, when we built the app, we had, like, a beta test. We had a few hundred users uh, testing the app for a few months this summer. And, uh, and so as a, as a designer was, of course, involved in, like, uh, understanding their problems and what was going on. Uh, and, of course, like, so, so we just had one designer join the team. And we really want to have, like, um, we want her to be, like, involved with users because, uh, I don't know if it's just specific to us, but uh, since we have such a diverse, uh, broad range of users, we need to understand who they are and how they use the product. So there is no way around letting you designers just see and talk to the users and see them use the product to understand what the problem is and like how to best design to solve it. I think there is a, like a fundamental difference on like what both of you do because you have uh, you have customers who are uh, you know them. Right, you know who your customers are. You know who is using your products. Uh, the animation is a, a bit particular in that sense that there are a million users coming every day, and less than one percent have an account. They just come and watch a video. So a lot of times we have no clue what do they want, why do they come, and what do they think. And we try to go to data for this to understand this. And this is the only because this is the only scalable way we will understand. Yes, we go out and we do get letters, we do user research, we invite people. But there's no way that you, the data you get from ten, asking questions to 10 people is going to be compatible with the data you're getting from millions, actually. Uh, so the customer-user connection is very, very different. So to follow up on this topic and maybe to deep dive a bit more, um, how can designer like lift their head up to just like take some step back from what they are doing on a daily basis to just think about the, the, the future, the, st the, like the future of design, the strategy, and how can you be like schizophrenic, like from a daily point of view to a more like long-term vision uh, with data and with everything you already said, uh, or can you, and how are you managing this like on a weekly or monthly basis, or do you manage these two 
to visions. So I don't know if it's, my answer is going to be like uh, really useful for designers because like as a product manager, of course, I'm involved in like uh, strategic discussion and just like trying to figure out where the, the company is going to go in the, in a few years. So and of course, it just comes back then to design and when we when we if we think about like when what we want to do in like the in the next two years, of course, we're going to lay the foundation right now with the, the current app. Um, so there's like, of course, a direct link be be between uh, thinking about the future and our work. I don't know if there's like a, a real uh, structured way of doing it. Uh, it's just discussion. It's just like, uh, uh, yeah, meetings and uh, and uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, retreats with the product team. So we go for a few days every year, like twice a year, and just think, just lay the foundation. Okay, where are we right now? Where do we want to go? What is going to be required to go there um so yeah that's maybe one structured way to think about the future and uh, and of course it impacts the daily work uh but then it's going to be a th i guess uh, also a daily practice of just trying to understand where design is going as a as a, as a field and uh so uh what it's, it's a bit uh, different because we have designers working in uh, projects where they sometimes lose the focus of the overall overall vision. And for that, what we do is we try to gather all the designers and all the stakeholders related to the project. So for example, we, we've done this for the home. Uh, when you download, if you download the Daily Motion app, please do. Uh, there, it's, it's very different than what you imagine. Uh, the home is the place that you can uh, go and watch videos. So we, we, we started, okay, what should be the, this? And then we started bringing people, designers, developers, stakeholders, and we started doing a series of uh, kind of workshops. And these workshops depend on the complexity of the project. Sometimes we do one day workshop, sometimes we do we follow the, exactly the Google Design Sprint methodology, so we do five days. Uh, but with this, we were able to focus, uh, defocus from the uh, kind of a daily routine and just focus on the, what, is the, what is the next thing to do. And we try to do this uh, kind of often, especially if there's a new subject that we don't know how to tackle. But if it's a, just an iteration or if it's like a daily work, then uh, we, we skip this. Okay, so, yeah, okay, we have a question. Hi. Um, yeah, it's about changing the st status quo. I don't know, I'm, I'm not a designer myself. We, we touched upon using frameworks, and it might be me, but if I go to all kinds of products and all kinds of websites, I do have the feeling that it's like one big designer agency who's, who's making a lot of the same stuff. So um, I was wondering what your view is on, on reproducing stuff that is just very similar. And then as a follow-up on, follow on to that, who is, according to you, someone you look up to in ter terms of design, who, what person or company is really changing that, that status quo? Want to go first? Yes, Benjamin. Um, yeah, I think uh, I really don't like uh, clones. And I think when you see like patterns of uh, websites and products just copying, blank copying, or Airbnb's uh, type layouts or stuff like that, it's, I think it hurts the company because people are like, of course there is like a usability. Of course, if Airbnb has figured something out, uh, it might be useful to uh, get the, the understand what they figured out, and of course you can use that in your product. But uh, so that's one point. It might be just you have a huge uh, research research bar of the, I don't know. But reproducing um, so visual core a core logic from a product it's useful. Reproducing just uh, blank uh, visual elements it's just going to hurt your brand, uh, and I I don't think it's really useful. Um, and so the, the other question was like, uh, do you have like one designer or something you look up to? Um, there is like one product I've been using a lot this, uh, this last few months that I really love, and I think they're doing it really different from a lot of companies. This notion, uh, I just like the way they handle their design. It's just, it's just so different from what everything is doing, everybody's doing right now, and uh, it just works. Uh, and so I think as a product designer, you really want to find something like that. Something's really something really unique to you, um, 
Of course, you can uh, inspire yourself from patterns of, of, um, of products, but then find your own voice. Uh, so yeah. So what do they, what does Notion do well that someone else is not doing well? Mm. <laughs> Tricky one. I mean, I think it's both the, the product, uh, the product itself is awesome. You can do everything on it. Uh, it just works well. Uh, so it's funny because I started using it alone and then uh, I just invited colleagues uh, to it because I had documented on it and they was like so pissed but they had to sign up for it. And then I think that now we're 40 or 50 accounts on the, in the company so everybody's using it. So uh, from a, like, it's hard to describe when you love a product, like there are a lot of factors coming into it. Uh, I mean, it's the visual, it's like, it's not, it's not really complex. It's really, it's a really simple the interactions, like the layout is not so hard, but it's built in the really right way. And I think they, they care a lot. Uh, one thing that I think good products feel like, they feel like they've been designed by people who care a lot. And when you see products that are like just plain copies of other products, uh, you don't, don't feel like that's the case. Um, there's another product I really love. It's uh, uh, to do Apple things. Uh, I think they just nailed the, the to-do app, which is uh, something a lot of other people have been trying to do. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm the same. I put everybody, uh, everybody outside uses uh, uh, Notion, and uh, and even my friends have started using Notion because of me, uh, because it's um, yeah, the tool is. It was a small team, and so when I discovered it, uh, it was like, okay, these guys are trying something, and I just signed up and to see what it was. And it's actually a really, what's amazing about this product is that it's an extension of your brain. Uh, it, it feels like your brain, and it's, it feels like um, you can do really anything, and I, and I mean, that's what I love about product design, is whenever you stumble upon something that actually is, you can see that it's going to be a tool that's going to make you so much, that's going to make you be able to do so many things and express so many things and actually it's just by yeah, solving the things that you want to do. Hello, I'm Gökçen. I use Notion as well. <laughs> uh, joke aside, and you, going back to your question, uh, I think we need copies of products. I mean, not in a sense that they copy the features, but they copy the visual because people don't need to learn new products all the time. I mean, there are patterns that are so obvious that we, should, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And there was an article in Medium which was actually talking about this one, where every product started looking the same, they're all white, they're all simple, big typography. It makes sense. I think it makes sense. I think uh, it's just like design systems. We don't need to redesign everything again and again and again. Uh, as we need to focus on creating the value within the product, not designing the details of typography or spaces. If there's something where that is working, let's use it. You want to add something? Okay, maybe a little bit. Well, thanks for your answers. Uh, it has been more than an hour since we started. The pizza starts smelling well at the back. Uh, how you guys are feeling? Are you okay? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, do you have any question? We can take maybe another round of question before we start and end up this talk. Anyone? Okay, well, I, I have a few other questions. Maybe we're going to take like one or two and then we can go uh, for some drinks and, and, and continue to talk about product design and whatever you want. Um, what is... I mean, what is the KPIs you are following? What is the, I mean, it's maybe like really low level, but what is the, the you talk a lot about some OKR uh, you are like following at, at side, the, the number of meetings you are doing. I'm pretty sure you have some like, especially at the motion, you have uh, KPIs in OKR. So what are these and um, how did, did you define them? And uh, how do you track them on a daily or weekly or monthly basis? Um. So for us, it's pretty, I mean, um, classic. And so we define a problem, and then we decide that if this KPI moves, then it's a success. And so we follow that KPI. And then we, we have uh, started implementing OKRs. Uh, we have been using OKRs outside for a long time. 
we used it um, for product. Uh, so the other business units are using it. And then we used it for the product last year. It worked pretty well. Then we stopped because it wasn't like the best ever. And now we're using it again. And so that's a way to track uh, your work and actually lead your team and uh, defining uh, uh, to make sure that you're actually doing the same things, uh, same thing as all the other business units. And everybody's going in the same direct direction. So that's what we're using currently. And it, they change every quarter. Yeah, same. I mean, there are no, there are no uh, KPS specific to design uh, or design team. Uh, in the emotion, there's only one KPI which everyone is following after. Of course, there are the sub KPIs, but uh, it's time watched. Uh, people are watching more videos. It's not even the videos watched actually, because it doesn't matter. Uh, it's the total time people are watching videos. So we, it, it goes against the, all the discussions about ethics and people spending too much time in products and everything. Uh, but this is the business, so we need to look at that one. So I, I agree with low, like of course, like all the critical. From a design point of view, all the classical um, KPIs, usability, satisfaction, and all all these things, uh, we don't separate like uh, design KPIs from product KPIs. But we have something very interesting, is, uh, which is that we have a product that helps you sleep better. So that's something we can measure. And what we are trying to do, like we shipped uh, the Dream Coach, which has, uh, for instance, one program which is called Cognitive and Behavioral Therapy, uh, which is supposed to help people who have chronic insomnia. And there's like one KPI, I have one colleague at the back who's going to smile, but we have one KPI we've been looking at, and it's going to be, of course, imp which is going to be, uh, which is going to impact product design, and it's called sleep efficiency. So that's a, a, an objective thing you can measure. It's basically the, the, the fraction of uh, the, the, the time asleep on the time spent in bed, and chronic insomniac spend a lot of time in their bed not sleeping. That's something we can measure with the headband, and that's something which is we are going to impact through product design. And the way we're going to do that is because we've designed an app which is supposed to coach you to, uh, through these programs to uh, guide you toward uh, sleeping better through um, within the CBT program, something which is called sleep restriction. We're going to ask you to go to sleep later than what you're supposed and used to go to sleep. Um, and if you respect that, your sleep efficiency is going to be much higher because you're just going to be very tired when you go to bed. You're going to have what we call sleep pressure. And then you have to, going to have a, a very high sleep efficiency. So that's something we can measure like from the, uh, from the headband and which is going to impact the app. Because if you don't, uh, if you don't follow the guidelines, if, you, if we tell you go to bed at 2 a.m., which is something we can do, uh, and you don't do it, we're going to know it. And if you don't do it, that's maybe because you're not engaged with the, with the program we, we designed and, uh, and the app. So, uh, so one thing we've been trying to do with the Dream Coach is to have like a very engaging app, because uh, we are going to ask you to do things which are which are hard, like go to bed late and just uh, change your behavior towards sleep, change your perception of sleep. So, uh, so that's one thing what I, which I think is interesting is like the thing we measure with the headband, which impact uh, design. Uh, another thing we've been doing a lot is. Uh, so, of course, everybody's wondering, does Dream work? And what we do is we, we do uh, clinical studies to prove that Dream works. And, um, and one thing we, we created is something called the uh, Adventure Program. Basically, all the Dream users uh, are able to opt in into what we call Adventure Program. And then we're going to propose uh, protocols, which is a, a test protocol. Uh, and during this protocol, we're going to try to measure one thing uh, and compare and just make a real clinical studies, but uh, using Dream users instead of uh, using not Dream. Thanks to Dream users. Um, and then the, the, these are data we're going to use in the product to improve the product over time. So, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Okay, maybe the last question. So, no, I saw raising. Yeah, okay, last one. Okay, Th thanks for the honor. Um, I, my question would be, um, why did you choose, because I have to think there's some young uh, and maybe even students, um, why did you choose design uh, and would you do it again? It's an interesting one to finish this talk. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've been making websites since I was um, 12 years old or something. And uh, when I actually didn't know that was a, 
an actual job that you could do. I mean, at that time, there was only like webmaster or something. And so I went and started looking for a school. And so I either had to go to like engineering school or art school, but I was like, no, there is, must be something in between. And that's when I found Ethic. And I first started as a front-end developer. I was a developer. Um, and uh, I was kind of uh, getting sick of implementing things that were badly designed. And, uh, <laughs> and so that's how I went into design. And, um, and the thing is, on a day-to-day -day basis, you solve more problems, I mean, as a designer than as a, an actual developer. And that's what I actually love to do, is to have impact and to feel like what I'm doing is meaningful. And, um, and so, yes, I would choose, I mean, design is everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> everything is design. And, uh, and so, yes, I would choose it again. <laughs> uh, a bit similar, actually. I was doing websites even before I studied design. Then I decided to study design. And I will just study the same thing and do the same thing again, no doubt, actually. Uh, and to be a bit opposite, I learned coding uh, because of the exact uh, opposite reasons. Because uh, I wanted to code, I wanted to build myself. So it's the other way around. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I think like uh, if for, for me it was just about building something, like wanting to see something in the world, like just having ideas. And like I think if you were able to design or code, if you're just about to build things, it get, it just gives you freedom. Uh, you just don't need any more to think things. You can do them. Uh, so I think it's very uh, liberating, uh, and that's why I learned design. Uh, another reason is I just cared a lot about products and I just liked a lot seeing good, um, well-designed products. Uh, and I tried to understand why, how they did it. And it just like from this, I understood it was called design and then just went from there and I tried to, uh, I, I learned it and, uh, and did it uh, as a work. But uh, it just started by uh, wanting to see things in the world and wanting to build them and caring and uh, caring about what I saw when I saw good well-designed product. I think the first product I saw and I was like really blown away by the design is, is uh, Path. I don't know if you remember the, this app uh, which, which um, launched as a, as a Facebook competitor in which you could only have uh, 150 friends or 50, I think. I don't know, but it was like, at this time it was a real new, uh, uh, new way of designing app. There was like interaction which nowhere had, had there ever, ever seen. And, uh, and so yeah, that's why that's what drove me into design, just seeing things that I really liked and uh, wanted to do, the, do them myself. So cool. Thanks a lot for these last answers. Uh, I think we should give them a like huge round of applause. <laughs>